We're moving on today. We, uh, we are going to start another topic that you all have asked for. And today we're going to start looking at, drum roll please. <laughs> today we're going to start looking at some messianic prophecies. Messianic prophecies from the Old Testament. And uh, you think about that. We're not talking about Christophanies because those are, those are different. You know, Christophany is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. And, of course, a Messianic prophecy is just that. It's a prophecy of his coming later on. So uh, we're going to look at some of these. There, there are roughly 40 Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. And so, and, well, it could take a while. <laughs> But, you know, some of them repeat, so some of them are, you know, in different books, the same prophecy. So but we'll, we'll just kind of take them, you know, one at a time and see how this works out. We might get two or three in one week. It just depends. And so today I thought it just fitting that we start with the first Messianic prophecy that we see in Scripture. So take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3, the very first prophecy of the coming Messiah. Now, obviously, we know Genesis chapter 3 as the, the, the fall of man. So Satan has come to the garden in the form of the serpent, and he's tempted Eve to eat of that fruit. And let me just say, side note here, it was not an apple. <laughs> the poor apple has been, been condemned and criticized for generations now because of this. But, uh, you know, it says forbidden fruit. That's all it says. It never says it's an apple, never names the fruit. But maybe we don't even know what it is. So anyway, the serpent comes and Satan uses that, that form to tempt Eve. And as we know the story, Eve sins and, and we have what we call the fall of man because sin has entered into the world. So the first messianic prophecy comes on the heels of that, no pun intended. You'll see why in a minute. And verse 15 is the first messianic prophecy. God is speaking here is the, the curse to these three. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So God is speaking to Satan here. And as he did, you know, he told Adam, here's your punishment for your part. He told Eve, here's your punishment for your part. And he told the, the serpent, here's your punishment for this part. He said, but not only that, but now... For generations to come, I'm going to put enmity between the seed of the woman and you for the rest of time. So when we think about that, you know, from the beginning, God had a plan for the redemption of mankind. I mean, this is not something that, that took God by surprise. He didn't have to come up with this on the fly. You know, it's, oh, Eve sinned, now I've got to figure something out. You know, this isn't what happened. You know, I, always, I like what Raymond Barber always used to say. He says, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? You know, God didn't go, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming. You know, God knew that this was going to happen. And he had this plan already there. But it wasn't until this moment that he set it into motion. And so he tells Satan here that for the rest of time, there's going to be strife, there's going to be enmity, there's going to be a struggle between you and the seed of the woman. Now, we understand that that prophecy means the coming of Jesus Christ. It's a messianic prophecy. But it doesn't end with Jesus Christ. That prophecy also includes us. And so we're going to look at that this morning. And so just a couple of different truths about this prophecy that I want to bring out. We're going to look at uh, different places in Scripture where it brings out the truth of this prophecy. So the first truth I want you to see is God's promised protection. Now, take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 16. So this, this prophecy, this messianic prophecy, is also mentioned over in Romans. And again, it doesn't go into you know, the exact wording, if you will. Uh, but we can see as we read this how it goes together. So we see God's promised protection on his people. Notice Romans 16, beginning in verse 19. For your obedience has come 
abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your foot shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So this is referencing that same messianic prophecy. We're talking about bruising the head of Satan. But who did he say is going to bruise his head? Not Jesus. The believers. He's speaking to believers here. And he says to these believers, not only are you going to bruise Satan's head, but notice in verse 19 what he says. He says, I would have you to be wise unto that which is good, but simple concerning evil. Now, that does not mean that he doesn't want us to understand Satan, that he doesn't want us to know our enemy. What he's saying there is he would rather have us all the knowledge in the world of everything that is good, but not understanding the practices of evil. Okay, so we know that evil is there. We know that evil is part of the world. Uh, we know that because Satan has control of this world, that evil is prevalent. But as a, excuse me, as a child of God, I should not have a first-hand knowledge of the practices of evil. Does that make sense? And that's what he's saying here. I want you to be wise unto that which is good. So get into the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Stay faithful to God and stay, stay on the right path because that is how you're going to be able to bruise the head of Satan. You know, what does the Bible tell us when, when Satan comes to tempt us? You know, we are to submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. We can't resist the devil without submitting to God first. So that's what he's saying here. As the children of God submit themselves to God, they're able to bruise the head of Satan. And so going back to that prophecy, that's what he's talking about. It wasn't only a prophecy about the, the coming Messiah, and his defeat of Satan, it was a prophecy of the power that he's given to us. The promise to help us overcome and the protection that he's going to give us against our enemy. So notice, if you will, again in verse 20, it says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. So now again, it doesn't say that we are going to bruise Satan's head. It says God is going to do the bruising. Okay, God's the one that's going to do the fighting for us. It's not in our power, it's not in our strength, it's not in our ability to fight Satan. We have to have God. And without God, we cannot overcome him. That's why he says, I want you to be wise unto good, but simple unto evil. Just trust God. Get into his word, walk with him, pray, seek his face, and seek his will, and that's where the bruising comes. It comes from God through us. What an amazing truth. I mean, you realize that, that Satan literally has no power over us. He cannot make us do anything. He can't, he can't make somebody sin. He can't make somebody do wrong. He can't make you do anything. All he can do is tempt you. But through God and his power, we're able to bruise his head. What an amazing truth. When we hold on to that truth, it will help us as we go through these temptations. So not only do, do we see uh, this, this promise of protection from God, but notice uh, over in Galatians chapter 4, we also see here through this prophecy the promise of adoption. So you think about this. Now, our, oh, our legal system has set up the process of adoption and do you know that the adoption process that we have in our nation comes from Scripture? Because if you adopt a child, and, and this is kind of a footnote, it's not even in my notes today. If you adopt a child, legally you cannot disinherit that child. You can disinherit your own children. Now think about that. Children that are born to you can be disinherited. But an adopted child cannot be disinherited according to our legal system. That comes from the Bible. Uh, well, it, like if you said you're no longer my son, I'm taking you out of the will. You do not belong to me any longer. Okay. So 
you can't do that to an adopted child. It's amazing, isn't it? And where do they get that? From Scripture. Because when God adopts us, we become his children forever. And we cannot be disinherited. We cannot be unadopted. All right? So Galatians chapter 4, we have this promise of adoption. Look, if, we, if you will, at verse 4. Galatians 4 and verse 4, notice. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of the woman, under the law, to redeem them that were, that, that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, notice here, he's talking about Jesus coming through the seed of the woman. Why does he say made of the woman? Because it goes back to this messianic prophecy. It goes back to Genesis chapter 3 when God said the seed of the woman will bruise your head. So we're, we're, we're working into this picture of adoption where Jesus Christ has come through the seed of the woman and God says because of this, because of his gift, because of who he is, now mankind can be adopted into the family of God. And not only are we adopted into the family, but now we can call God Abba, Father. And that word Abba there is the Jewish equivalent to our daddy. So when, when your child says, Daddy, I need you, I mean, that has a whole lot different meaning than father, right? I mean, fathers in the room understand that. When your child looks at you and says, Father... I need something. <laughs> you know, it's like, Father, what are you talking about? But when they say Daddy, I mean, that just, that just kind of pulls on the heartstrings, doesn't it? Personal yeah? Is this Daddy too childish? Well, yeah. But here's what we need to understand. Right. But that is the picture. That's the picture that God's trying to give us here. I am so close to you through Jesus Christ that you can now call me daddy. Yeah, we look at that and we say, what? Yeah, you're right. It does seem informal. Well, okay, you call me. But... <laughs> Right. I never knew him. Yeah. I never had the experience of climbing up in the bed. Right. So for me personally, when I really need my Lord, that's what I do. Exactly. I can climb in your lap. Yeah, right. Your arms around me. So it's that it's that personal relationship. And that's what he's trying to lay out here. Through the seed of the woman. We can now come to God through adoption and call him daddy. What an amazing picture. And what an amazing truth. Because as I said, we cannot be unadopted. We, we remain in the family of God no matter what once that adoption takes place. So we think about this. It says here, when the fullness of time had come. So God's timing is perfect. Okay, we see this messianic prophecy back in Genesis chapter 3. So the beginning of time, when the first sin enters the world, God already sets this plan in motion. And it's thousands of years later that Christ comes to fulfill part of that prophecy, to be born of the seed of the woman. And so he's setting this into motion because in reality, you know, this is not a prophecy that will really be completely fulfilled until the end times. Now, we see, we see fulfillment daily through this prophecy, and we'll get to that in a minute. But as we think about that, and we think about how God just laid this out in the perfect time. He knew when, he knew how, he knew who. He knew every aspect of this prophecy before it was even set into motion. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. Continuing on this, this theme of adoption and understanding how important this is because without this prophecy, 
without Jesus coming through the seed of the woman, this adoption is not possible. I mean, you've got to understand, we serve a righteous, holy God. And a righteous, holy God cannot just forgive sin. You understand this? Sin has to be paid for because he's righteous, because he's holy. And there's only one way to do that. And God laid that out. Death comes because of sin. And so when we think about that, this, this topic of adoption is so amazing. All right, Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, I want you to get this picture because this is, this is good. <laughs> Because like I said, we, we have a righteous, holy God. And God cannot just say, I'll forgive their sin and go with that. Because his righteousness has to be satisfied. If someone came in and murdered your entire family and then they walked into a courthouse and the judge says, well, I'll forgive that, he can go free. Would you call that a righteous judge? Absolutely not. There has to be punishment. There has to be a penalty. There has to be payment. And so because we serve a righteous God, the only way that that payment could be made is someone had to die. And that's why it says here in Hebrews that Jesus came and we are partakers of him through the blood and through the flesh because he came in the flesh. He chose to come through the seed of the woman and he was made flesh so that he could defeat death. And the one that had the power over death, and who was that? The devil, just like the Bible tells us here. So again, going back to that prophecy, he comes through the seed of the woman to bruise the head of Satan by defeating death. What an amazing picture. And without him, you and I cannot have that because through him, we too have defeated death. And that's why he said we came to him in fear because you know, we were under the bondage of death before we came to him. We were under the, the penalty of death before we accepted Christ. And now that we have accepted Christ, we have the adoption of sons, the adoption of children into the family of God, and we can no longer die. Are you getting this picture? What an amazing truth. I and mean, this is the power of God's adoption. We might face a physical death someday. If the rapture does not happen, this body will die. But our soul, our spirit, will continue on for all eternity with God. Because spiritually, we cannot die. It's amazing. And those that live their lives without Christ, when they face that physical death, they're going into eternal death. Now think about that. It's only through the seed of the woman that this was possible. And God laid out this plan in his infinite wisdom to allow Jesus to be born through this virgin birth to become flesh so that in that flesh he could die for our sins. And that's the only way that we have life. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I get excited over that. <laughs> when you start putting the pieces together and you realize how important this adoption is, you know, without the adoption, there's no life. Without the adoption, there's no bruising of the head of Satan. Because we only have that power through him. We cannot defeat Satan on our own. We cannot defeat Satan with, with our abilities, with our power, with our wisdom. We have to have God to do it. All right? So not only do we see the power of his adoption, we see the power of his protection. Now notice this. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 12. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it, you know, it, it, it's amazing, though, when you say Revelation, people just kind of start freaking out. But, you know, I know some Christians that refuse to read the book of Revelation, and I can't figure out why. I mean, I love it. It's encouraging because I know the end of the book. Amen. So in the book of Revelation, I want you to notice this, and we're going to kind of go through this systematically. 
And this is our, our last truth that we see this morning. We see God's promised victory. So we're going to see this prophecy come to fruition. But as we look at this, I want you to notice that through chapter 12, through the first six verses, we actually have a history of the church. So this is not some, some prophecy that John is seeing. He's actually seeing the church being formed and he's giving a brief history of this. Now you know that you know, when Jesus gave this vision to John, there's a lot of symbolism in Revelation. There's a lot of prophecy. There's a lot of fulfillment of prophecy. A lot of different things going on here. So it's difficult sometimes to really determine what he's actually seeing. And even John knows it's difficult to determine this. All right, but I want you to notice this, beginning in verse 1. We're going to go through this whole chapter, so bear with me. Verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with sun, or clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, that's not some mystical goddess. It is actually the church. Again, this is the history of the church. This is the birth of the church. So this woman represents the church of God. Okay, now notice this. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, so we see this picture of this, this dragon. This is Satan. This is the battle, the, a spiritual battle that is taking place over the church. And so Satan is there ready and ready to pounce and waiting to destroy the church. This is what it's talking about. He, he wants to stop the church from being formed. He wants to stop the church from going forward. He wants to stop the church from growing. So he's constantly in battle with the church. And this is what we see here in these beginning verses. And, and notice verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. So, I mean, we're, we're seeing this, this history unfold of the church being literally birthed. Okay, and, and so we get this picture of the seed of the woman is not just Jesus Christ. Now, he's the ultimate victor. He's the ultimate uh, bruiser, if you will. But, but this picture of the seed of the woman being born and being brought forth is the church of God. That's literally being birthed and being attacked by Satan, being attacked by his demons, and this constant battle that we face. And so Jesus comes as the victor to the church to help the church and to strengthen the church. But how many times has the church been persecuted? How many times has the church been driven underground? You know, in, in the first century church, they had to hide. They had to hide in catacombs. They had to hide because the, the Rome was oppressing them and Rome was trying to stop them because Satan was at the helm. And he was attacking the church because he knows this prophecy. He knows that he is defeated. He knows that he doesn't stand a chance. He knows that, say, that he's going to lose and that, that Christ is going to get the victory. He knows these things. He just doesn't know when. And he's going to do everything in his power and everything in his ability to, to annihilate the church if he can. So let's keep moving. Verse 7. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his archangels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Notice it doesn't leave any, any question as to who this dragon is. You know, God wants us to know who this dragon is. It's Satan. Deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come 
salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, you remember, as we talked about the sons of God a few weeks ago, you know, what was Satan doing? He would go before God and he was accusing the brethren day and night. I mean, every time he turned around, Satan was there saying, oh, you know, they're sinning, you can't trust them, don't answer their prayer. And now it's showing us here we have victory. Jesus has come, and now he's going to defeat this dragon, he's going to defeat this enemy, and it's finally going to come to an end. But not yet. All right, we're still in this battle, folks. We're still fighting this dragon. We're still fighting this, this, this enemy. We're still fighting Satan. This, this part has not happened yet. Yes, Jesus came in the flesh, born of a virgin. Jesus died on the cross. He paid the penalty for sin. He defeated death. And he defeated Satan in that moment. But there's coming another defeat where it will be settled. It will be done. And we will no longer have to deal with sin. We will no longer have to deal with Satan. We will no longer have to deal with this flesh. And, and, and that's what this prophecy is set forth for. To help us to understand that in the end, we get the victory, folks. Yes, Satan is there. Yes, he's attacking. Yes, he's a headache. Yes, he's a pain. But through Christ, we have the power to bruise his head because he can't do anything to us. He has no power over us. All he can do is tempt us. He can, it's like that nagging little, you ever have a gnat that just won't go away? You know, that's Satan. He has no more power over you than that gnat does. But we give him so much authority because we think he's so powerful. And, but now, don't get me wrong, we can't defeat him without God. But through Christ, we have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. So we have victory over this enemy. Now notice this. As he continues here, in verse 13. Oh, sorry, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, and to the sealed for the devil... Uh, is come down unto you having a great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He, he knows he's not going to be around long. He knows the end. He just doesn't know when. Verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness and into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, and he might cause her to be carried away from the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have testimony of Jesus Christ. So, I mean, look, this is, this is all about the church. This is about Satan's attack on the church. And, and he's just, he's relentless. He's coming, he's fighting, he's pushing. He's doing everything in his power to stop the church. But God is protecting the church. And through Jesus Christ, we have victory over Satan. And there's nothing that he can do to stop us. And this is what we've got to understand here today. This messianic prophecy from Genesis chapter 3 is going to be fulfilled when Jesus returns and that final battle when Satan is defeated and cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. You see, we have the ability through Christ to bruise his head. Satan is one day going to face Jesus Christ and he's going to be crushed. And we need to understand this. We can't crush him, we can bruise him. You know, you just kick him in the head. You know, next time the temptation comes, just kick him. Just get, get out. Kick him in the head. Because we can do that. 
We have that ability through Christ. And just pray for the day that Jesus comes to crush him. Because it's coming. And now, again, when, when you think about this, <laughs> you, you read the Bible, and, and you read Genesis chapter 3, and you're going, well, this just seems hopeless. What, what in the world? I mean, sin enters the world, and now death passed upon all mankind because Adam and Eve sinned, and now I have to pay their price. And look, we, we all come from the same people. And I, I've said this before, I'll say it again, there's one race in this world. Mankind. We're different colors, different sizes, different shapes. We are all the same race. Satan divides. Satan uses everything to divide humanity. He uses politics to divide. He, he uses color of skin to divide. He uses nationalities to divide. He uses all these things to divide where God is trying to unify. God is trying to bring us all together under the adoption of of sons to become his family and to have victory over this, this dragon, this Satan, this devil. You know, when he rears his ugly head in your life, like I said, just kick him in the head. I mean, you can do it figuratively or you can do it, you know, just do a kick. I don't I, <laughs> But we have that ability. And we wouldn't know that without this prophecy. I mean, it says in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity, that's, a, just, that's just a constant strife. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So what does that mean? The worst thing that Satan can do to us is bruise our heel a little bit. Cause us to limp. <laughs> Can't stop us. You understand that? He cannot stop us. He has no ability to stop any child of God. And what an amazing picture. Now, again, there's probably a whole lot more to this that we could dig into. We could dig into Revelation. We could dig into all the symbolism and all the meanings. But truth of the matter is, when you look at this chapter in, in Revelation, it's simply a, a history of the church and the attacks of the church and Satan trying to stop the church. But he can't. We have the power, we have the authority through Jesus Christ because he is that seed of the woman that is coming one day to crush our enemy. What an amazing truth. And we can go out there and we can serve God and we can just be faithful to God every day knowing that there's nothing Satan can do to stop us. Isn't that good? I mean, that's encouraging to me. I hope it's encouraging to you. But we need, to, we need to tap into that power. We need to tap into that authority and submit to God so that we can resist the devil. Amen? Father, we thank you today for this time and thank you again for these truths. And Lord, as we begin this study in these messianic prophecies, help us as we try to rightly divide the word of truth and understand these prophecies, uh, not for uh, an, an added knowledge that we would have, but just for a better understanding of your grace and your mercy and your love for us because that's what these prophecies mean. You love us and we thank you for that. Father, we pray you'd bless the services this morning, bless, uh, bless the uh, speaker as they come and may we have the message that we need for our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I think he is, I, I'm not sure. <laughs>